Hey, Builders, before we jump into today's show, I need to know something. Are you and I connected on the socials? Because if we're not, we need to be. So connect with me. I'm on Facebook at Robin Jackson. I am on Twitter at Robin underscore Mind Steps. I'm on LinkedIn at Robin Jackson. Let's connect and let's keep the conversation going. Now, on to the show. You're listening to the School Leadership Reimagined Podcast, episode 254. How do builders like us make a dramatic difference in the lives of our students in spite of all the obstacles we face? How do you keep your vision for your school from being held hostage by resistant teachers, uncooperative parents, ridiculous district policies, or a lack of time, money, or resources? If you're facing those challenges right now, here is where you'll find the answers, strategies, and actionable tips you need to overcome any obstacle you face. You don't have to wait to make a difference in the lives of the people you serve. You can turn your school into a success story right now with the people and resources you already have. Let's get started. Hey, Builders. Welcome to another episode of the School Leadership Reimagined podcast. I'm your host, Robin Jackson. And today I want to talk to you about something that someone asked me recently at the ASCD conference. It was great seeing so many of you at the ASCD conference and thanks so much for coming to my session. And every time I do a conference session, doesn't matter the conference, um, when I get there and I get set up, once I'm set up, there are usually a lot of people in the room who are just kind of waiting for the time to start. And so I hate that. So what I do is I normally open up the floor for Q&A. So it's always a good idea to get to my sessions early because you can get, you know, some questions answered, hear other people's questions get answered. It's really a fun time. So I was doing that at the ASCD conference and there was a gentleman there who asked a really interesting question. He said, you know, I am about to start my AP journey and I am a builder in my heart and I want to make sure that the school that I select and the principal for whom I work is a builder. So what are some signs to let me know that someone is a builder? We'd have a whole bunch of time to go in deep for the answer. Um, so I gave him a quick answer there. But I've been thinking about it a lot because I do think it's really important, especially as you are on your buildership journey, to understand what are the signs that someone is a builder. If you are an aspiring principal and you are looking for a place to land, it's really important for your buildership journey to work with someone who is a builder. To it, Otherwise, you're just going to be frustrated. I know too many APs right now who are builders and they, and they want to do this work, but they're working for a principal that's afraid to take risks or they're working for a principal who um, shuts their buildership work down and pushes them more towards a leadership or worse, a boss paradigm. So it's important to be able to screen that way. If you are already a principal, it's important to, as you're looking for APs or um, other people to work in your building, that you can recognize, even if people don't know that they're a builder yet, these are some signs that someone is a potential builder. Um, you know, you can, I know what most people do is just say, here, are, here's my vision. Do you agree with that vision? And if I want the job badly enough, I will say, yeah, I agree with your vision. I love your vision. I, I, I can't wait to do that work. But do they really? And so there's some other things that you can listen for in the conversation that help you recognize whether or not the person you're dealing with is truly a builder, even if they don't know it yet. So I want to share that with you today, especially as we're going into interview season, whether you are switching districts, you may be a principal looking for a job yourself and wondering if the superintendent that you are thinking about working for will, will support your buildership, uh, your buildership dreams and your buildership vision. So this is another reason why this is so important, okay? So I want to give you three telltale signs that may not be so obvious, but will let you know if someone is a builder or or will support you as a builder, okay? So the first one is, of course, the obvious one. It's the bigness of their own vision. Usually when someone is a builder, their vision is is bigger, right? So they're not, their vision isn't just, you know, I want to grow 3% here or 5% there. Like if you hear that, you know you're not dealing with a with a builder. If you hear things like, I think we can grow more, I'm really interested in hearing about how we can 
eventually reach all kids. Those are signs that that person is a builder. Now, that's the obvious answer, right? Everybody kind of knows that, that if if the closer someone comes to having that 100% vision, or even the closer someone comes to to getting excited about hearing about your 100% vision, the more likely they are to be a builder. So that's the obvious one. The second sign that that can let you know that someone is a builder is to listen to how they talk about time. So builders think in bigger time increments. A boss is thinking about next day, next week, next month. So when when they're talking to you, they're talking about what their plans are to either get to the end of the school year or what their plans are to get through next month or next week. Their, Their time increments are very short. And that's as far as they see. That's as far as they think. That's a sign that you're dealing with somebody who's going to be a boss. And usually that's also a sign that you're dealing with someone who is not thinking about the long term. They're just busy putting out fires. They're busy dealing with just the day to day. They're stuck in the day to day and they're going to want you to be stuck in the day to day. And so when you start talking about this bigger 100% vision, it's going to sound like nonsense to them because they can't imagine getting to 100% the semester. And that's what they're worried about. So you want to be careful about people whose time horizon really kind of is limited to a semester or limited to the next couple of weeks or the next couple of months. Now, if you're talking to a leader, their time horizon is going to be next year. So they're talking about the next year, but they can't see beyond that. So leaders tend to think in like year-long chunks. So right now, a lot of leaders are thinking about their 24-25 plan. They're, They're already starting to think about like the next school year, but that's as far as they can see. And their plans don't extend beyond the school year. So when you talk to them about, okay, so what are the things that you're putting in place or what are the things that you are thinking about? They're gonna say, well, this year we really wanna get this in. And that's as far as they go. And the challenge with people who think in those year-long increments is that all of their strategies are limited by the year. They're not considering strategies that might take longer, but render or yield more results on students. And the other danger is that they typically change strategies for one year to the next. So this year we're doing uh, PLCs. Next year we're doing PBIS. The following year we're going to do uh, ninth grade academies. The following year we're going to do science of reading. Oh, and then we're going to do math notebooks. And so they are thinking in year long chunks and their vision is going to be capped or limited by that year. So be careful about that. You know, you're talking to a builder when the builder starts talking about bigger time chunks. So the next three years and they're making plans that they're putting in place that they they intend to last for longer than a school year. So a builder might also institute PLCs, but they're not thinking about, well, this year we're going to focus on PLCs. They're saying we're putting PLCs in place so that we can achieve our bigger vision. Do you see the difference? They're not talking about the thing itself. Like this is the focus for the year. They are talking about the next step in our progression towards our vision is this thing. So I'm not putting it in for the year. I am investing in this particular strategy because I have long range aspirations for this strategy to make a difference in terms of our bigger long-term vision. So If you are talking to somebody and they are talking about long stretches of time, they are talking about investing for the long term, then you know that that person is a builder. Now, I also want you to apply this to yourself, right? So if you hear yourself talking about, well, this year or this semester or this month or this week a lot, then that's a sign that you are slipping out of buildership and and you're going back to the way you were trained as a leader or as a boss. And so I want to encourage you to even monitor your own language. It's really, really important that when you're talking to your staff, when you're talking to your teachers, that you help them to recognize that the things that we're doing now, we're investing in because we are thinking long-term. 
Okay. So a lot of times people hear builder shift and they say, oh yeah, your vision in three years or less. And so they start trying to talk in three-year time frames, but they're not thinking that way. It's really important that as a builder, you stretch out your time frame. Now I struggle with this too, because I'm thinking about, oh, we got to get this done right now because uh, you know there's a problem that I have to solve or there's something, there's a goal that's in front of me. And I have to fight against that and start thinking about, is this something that I want to be doing three years from now? Is this something that I can see us doing five years from now? Because if it isn't, should I be doing it now? Because usually if you're thinking about, well, this is what we're going to do right now, but then later on we'll do something else. And what you're doing is investing in a Band-Aid and not investing in a long-term solution, right? So I've done podcasts about this before where there's a saying that says, if you can't, if you don't see yourself doing it for the next five years, you shouldn't do it for a day. If you don't see yourself doing it for the next decade, you shouldn't do it for a day. And builders understand that. So we're not saying, well, this is what we're going to do right now until we get to this point, then we'll do something else. Builders are saying, if we're going to invest the time and energy in doing something, we're going to do it for the long term. And here's what it does for your staff. It keeps your staff from lurching from one initiative to the next. And because they know that it's not going to last, they never invest fully. So how do you even know that the thing that you're investing in will work if nobody invests in it fully because you know next year it's going to be something else? Give yourself time. Give yourself time to really get good at something. And so anything that you introduce as, as, a, as a policy, as a strategy, as a tactic that you're doing in your school, you need to make sure that the thing that you're, you're suggesting is something that you feel like you can do a decade from now, that it will still serve you a decade from now. If it doesn't, you shouldn't do it for a day. No Band-Aids. Okay, so that's the second way. The first way, the bigness of their vision. The second way, the length of their time horizon. And the third way is the type of problems that they solve. Okay, this one, really, really important. And it's very subtle. But once you once you learn this and you start learning to listen for this, you're going to be amazed at how clear it really is. When you talk to someone, what kinds of problems are they solving, right? Are they solving tactical problems? Are they solving things like, well, you know, we're trying to get our attendance from 85% you know, to at least 90% attendance, right? That, so we're, we're, we're going to, we, what kind of, you know, phone tree should we use? Or um, we want to increase more rigor. So I'm looking for a lesson planning format that I can get all of my teachers using so we can, you know, get everybody to write rigorous lesson plans. Or does anybody have a, a, a great warm up activity that will get students more engaged? Those are tactics, and if people are looking, if the problem they think they have is I need the right warm up activity or I need the right form or I need the right lesson planning format or I need the right phone tree for my attendance problem. If you're looking for a tactical solution, then the problem that you're solving is too small. And frankly, any of those things might work if you're if you're if you if they're part of a bigger a bigger strategic thinking. But if you're just focused on the tactics, I just need you know I I noticed that uh, my teachers aren't differentiating. So uh, does anybody have a good book that I can get my teachers to use for a book study so they can differentiate more? Yeah, I see those kinds of requests come all the time in some of the principal groups that I'm a part of, and every time I see that, I say. That's the wrong problem to be solving. If you are talking to somebody and the problems that they're solving are small, are tiny, are tactical, that person is not thinking about a vision. That person is thinking about what Band-Aid can I slap on this problem right now to, so that I don't, so this problem doesn't cause me any stress anymore. And if you find yourself doing that as well, you want to stop and check yourself because if you are just focused on the, the tiny tactical details and those are the problems you're solving, the problems you're solving aren't big enough and you need bigger problems. 
Now, leaders solve slightly bigger problems. Le- leaders solve strategic problems. So leaders are, are asking themselves questions like, how can we raise test scores between now and the next benchmark? Um, what kind of training or PD can I give staff that will help them plan more rigorous lessons? Um, what books should I be reading that will help me get better as a leader? Those are bigger problems and the tactical problems are very strategic. And we've been trained to solve problems like that. So when we solve those kinds of problems, we feel like this is the work, this we're doing our jobs, but here's the problem with that. When you focus on even those bigger strategic problems, you know, how do I increase test scores this year? I've noticed that attendance is sinking. So what can we do to improve attendance? Um, I noticed when I did on a, a walkthrough that the teachers are not teaching to a level of rigor. How do we give them more PD to help them teach with a greater degree of rigor? When we solve those kinds of problems... The challenge with doing that strategically is we are not the we we're 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 always putting out the next fire. So I see a problem, I try to get strategic about solving that problem, and then that takes me to the next problem and the next problem after that. The other problem with strategic thinking strategically is that it's not connected to our bigger vision. So yes, I am solving those problems. I'm trying to be strategic about solving those problems. But a lot of times doing that outside of the context of the bigger vision means that I choose solutions that I'm going to later abandon because I realize those solutions are not getting me to where I need to be, okay? And then the last problem with that strategic thinking is that you don't know what's ahead. So you're trying to be strategic and kind of solve it now and kind of, you know, look ahead to the future, but you don't know what you're going to encounter. So you're looking for a solution to the problem that you have right now with a danger that that solution may not work six months from now because things have changed and you saw the problem that's in front of you today, but you haven't really solved the problem. You've mitigated it. The solution helps you deal with it today, but it doesn't eliminate the problem altogether. Builders are different. Builders are saying, I don't want to keep solving the same problems over and over again. How do I eliminate the problem so that it just doesn't show up anymore? So when builders are are looking at problems, they're looking for the opportunity that the problem suggests. Let me give you an example. I was working with the principal and um, the principal is having a a really a big challenge with working on on creating more rigor in there for the teachers. So the teachers, the instruction that the teachers, um, that he observed the teachers in the classroom doing, it wasn't very rigorous. It's kind of like, you know, kind of lockstep following the curriculum. Yes. But the teachers were doing all the work. The students weren't doing the thinking for themselves. Okay. Now, As a builder, he would have said, I mean, sorry, as a boss, he would have said, oh, I don't see any rigor. Is there like a, um, is there like a, um, a thing that they can all use, a strategy that they can all use to increase rigor? And he might have gone to John Hattie or someplace like that and said, okay, what's the highest yield strategy? I'm going to teach it all the teachers. And then I'm going to force teachers to use that in their classroom so we can have more rigor. He might have walked around with a checklist to check and see, did the teachers use the rigorous instructional strategy that he trained? And then that would be it. Okay. So that's kind of the tactical piece. Now, if he's a leader, he might have said, well, you know, I need my teachers don't necessarily understand rigor. So I'm going to do a PD, maybe a four part PD series on rigor, get all the teachers trained on rigorous instruction. Um, I'm going to get them the tools they need. We're going to have conversations about rigor. I'm going to have them work in the PLCs on rigor. I'm going to be observing for rigor. It's a strategic move this year. We're going to make this year about rigor. And then once we do that, then hopefully they'll have it and then we can move on to the next thing. Okay. Here's what a builder does. Builder says, I wonder why the teachers aren't teaching with rigor. The curriculum is rigorous. They're following the curriculum. And yet they're still not rigor in a classroom. What's really going on here? 
And then the builder would start investigating. The builder would talk to teachers. The builder would be in PLCs, observing teachers and looking at how they plan. The builder would be looking at the curriculum itself and seeing, is the curriculum really as rigorous as they think they are? The builder would be kind of thinking about what's happening in the school. And as the builder does that, the builder finds the opportunity. The builder gets to the root of the problem and says, here's the opportunity for our staff. Hey, Robin here, and I just want to break in real quick to ask you a huge favor. You see, I want to get the word out to everybody about Buildership, and I could use your help. If you're really enjoying this episode, would you mind just going to your podcast platform and leaving a quick review? You see, the reviews get the word out. They tell other people this is a great show. Other people who have never heard of School Leadership Reimagined before can hear about it. And you'd be sharing the word about Buildership. So would you mind just leaving a quick review? It would mean the world to me. Okay, now back to the show. Now, that opportunity might mean at the end of the day, yeah, there needs to be more training. But the training is not just let's buy a rigorous training package and do that. The training is saying, okay, how what aspect of rigorous instruction do we really need if we're going to get to our vision? How is this keeping us from our vision? And what's the opportunity here? If I remove this barrier, how does that get us to our vision? And then the builder is going to figure out, okay, even if we do training, we're going to focus our training on this aspect of rigor. Because if we can get our teachers thinking in this way and connect it to our vision, that's how we're going to achieve our goal. And so the builder is not looking to solve problems. The builder is looking to see what those pro- what opportunities those problems represent, okay? So, in this example, when we started looking at it and really thinking about it, we saw two things. First of all, the teachers didn't really understand what rigor was. They thought rigor meant harder, more complicated, that sort of thing. So, we had to clear that up, right? So, there's an opportunity there to have a conversation as a staff about what rigor really means. But the other opportunity we saw was that a lot of the instructional strategies that teachers were using were quote unquote the right strategies, but there was the there was an opportunity to for teachers to to take those strategies and find unique ways for students to engage in the material. And the teachers weren't seeing those opportunities. The teachers felt like they had to do the thing the way that it was supposed to be done. So there was an opportunity for us to go back and have a conversation about our vision, about our mission, about the core values, and then have teachers really see what that meant for their instructional practice without having to force teachers to kind of all use the same strategy. So the PD looked a little different. So first thing we did was we assessed teachers in terms of their understanding of rigor. And we moved, we put teachers into four different groups. Those who were novices around rigor, those who were apprentices, that's the language we use. You know, the novices, they don't really understand it. They need some basic instructions on what rigor is and helping them understand that. And they really were struggling with some lesson planning as well. And then we put the, some teachers in a group we called apprentices. These were teachers who had a lot of the instructional strategies, had a basic understanding, but couldn't quite figure out how to make it work in their classroom for their subject. Then we had a group we call practitioners who were doing a pretty good job with rigor and the instructional strategies, but we saw opportunities for tweaks that could make it even better. And then we had the master teachers whose classrooms were so rigorous and so masterfully done. And with the master teachers, we were working with what are the adaptations? What are the things that you are doing that maybe we don't even understand that we might be able to share with other people and standardize it? Um, how do you, how would you take this curriculum and make it more rigorous? And we were giving them opportunities to play with stuff. And we divided them into those four groups. And the opportunity was to work with teachers where they were. And the goal of each group was to help them to get to the next level so that they could tackle the next challenge in front of them. What's really interesting is that when we did this and we got, first of all, all the teachers were engaged, all the teachers were getting PD at the level that they needed it. The conversations were rich. Everybody felt unleashed to be very creative. And we saw tangible progress. And then a matter of months, every single, we couldn't find a classroom that wasn't rigorous because we found the opportunity there. So when you think like a builder, 
you're you're not thinking about solving problems from a tactical level or strategic level. You're looking at the problem, understanding the problem first and saying there's an opportunity here. And I promise you, when you start to think that way as a builder, everything changes. I'll tell you, I'll I'll be honest with you. Even though I you know, live, eat, and breathe buildership. There are times when I still struggle with buildership. And we were working on something uh, a few, like maybe a month ago, and it was a problem, right? And so I went, because it was a problem that felt big and, and I, I felt a lot of pressure around it. The first thing I did was I start looking for tactical solutions. And you know how this works because we're all educators, right? So I started reading everything. I started, I mean, like I was telling a group the other day, I had 52 tabs open on my computer with different websites. I was looking at, okay, what is this person doing? What is this person doing over here? And I was looking for a tactical solution. And all it did was make me feel more and more and more overwhelmed, right? So then the next thing I did is I said, okay, these are tactics. I don't really know what's the strategy. So then I started studying different strategies and trying on different strategies. Should we do this strategy? Should we do this strategy? Should we do this strategy? And I, again, felt very overwhelmed. There are a lot of options. Which one's the right one to do? I don't know if you feel that way sometimes when you're, you know, looking for the strategy and the solution. How do I know this one's going to work, right? So I was feeling that way. And whenever I feel overwhelmed, the way that I deal with it is I just go grab um, some paper or sit down at the computer and I just get it all out. I just, just do, just do what it, what's called free writing. I just write whatever's on my mind. And over time, stuff starts to organize itself. Just seeing my thoughts on paper helps me to kind of say, what's really going on here? And I said, the problem is, I talk buildership. I'm trying to solve a buildership problem, but I'm not thinking like a builder. So instead of a tactic or strategy, where is the opportunity? What's the problem that I'm trying to solve? And then where's the opportunity in that problem? And so I looked at the problem that I was trying to solve and I thought I was trying to solve one problem, but when I really thought about it, I realized that's not the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to solve this other problem here. So I got to the root. I realized the problem that I was really trying to solve. And then I said, okay, so here's the problem. What are the opportunities? And the way that I found the opportunities, I took every obstacle, every objection, and I turned it around. So, you know, let's think think about it in the school thing. Well, I don't have the time during the day to get teachers together. There's no common planning time. So what would that look like in a school context? Okay. So let's say that your problem is that you don't see a lot of rigor happening in in the classroom. And so you go in and you, you're looking at all the things and then you say, okay, we understand that that the, the teachers don't really understand rigor. I'd love to group them into groups, but I don't have any common time. I get teachers once a month for their contract, for a staff meeting, and then that's it. I don't have any other common time where I can get teachers together to be able to group them in a way that's differentiated. That's the obstacle. All right, so let's find the opportunity in the obstacle. Okay, I don't have time to do it in the traditional way. How else could I do it? Could I do some sort of online PLCs? Um, Could I rethink my master's schedule? Um, Could I adjust uh, the, the... the, the 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 bell schedule so that we find a, a chunk of time during the school day that teachers could do this. Could I find other opportunities for teachers, even though they're grouped in these things, do they have to work together? Is there an opportunity for teachers to do some individual study, but they're on different levels and they're working through the levels? Can I leverage? Is there an opportunity to leverage technology in ways that I haven't considered? Um do the, all the teachers have to get to together in a group or are there opportunities for teachers who are on the same level to work together in pairs so that they're holding each other accountable? Um, do they have to work with people on their level or could I make groups of people at different levels, but they're still working on material and supporting each other? So there are all of these opportunities that exist in the problem of getting teachers together. And I noticed this, you know, in office hours, a lot of times people get stuck and we have office hours inside of BU. And when people come to BU for office hours and they say, okay, so I'll say, tell me where you're getting stuck. And they, um, 
they start talking about all the obstacles. And then as I don't have to know anything about their situation, I can coach them on that by saying, all right, so let's look at the opportunities and the obstacles. And when you do that, it un- there's something that unlocks for you. There's something that that unlocks in terms of 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 feeling that sense of hopelessness because you you start to see there are other options and you get really creative and innovative and it's so much fun. So you want to work with or for somebody like that. So when you talk to them, I would ask them questions like, "So what's the biggest challenge that you're facing right now and 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 how are you tackling that?" Because listening to them talk about, "Well, I've been reading a lot or um, you know, I I I have this great tactic that I want to try versus, "Well, I've been thinking a lot about the problem itself." and trying to understand that. And and I feel like the problem has some opportunities there. That's the sign that you're working with a builder. That's a sign that that's somebody who's going to that 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 that's who's going to to really look for how do we eliminate problems rather than how do we just mitigate problems. That's a sign that you're going to work with somebody who's going to support you to help do the same thing. So just to recap, there are three big tells that builders have that are subtle, but if you listen, you can hear it. And even if that person doesn't identify as a builder yet, you know that this is a person who is a builder in their hearts. The first one is the bigness of their vision. How big is their vision? Is their vision 100% or some, or is it something else? If their if their vision isn't really truly about all kids, I know people say all kids, but when you talk to them, they say, "Well, you know, I'd like to get all kids," and it's it's more of a dream, not a vision. They're not focused on working towards helping all kids. Listen for that. The bigness of their vision, not their hopes, their dreams, but their actual vision for what you, their school or their organization or their work can actually do. Okay. The second thing is the 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 length of their time horizon. All right. So the bigness of their vision, big vision, all kids, length of their time horizon. Do they talk in days, weeks, semesters? Do they talk in school years? Or do they talk in larger time horizons, three years, five years? Um, because that's a person who's focused more on the bigger vision instead of just surviving this year. And then the third thing is the quality of the problems that they are solving. Are they solving tactical problems? Are they solving strategic problems? Or are they looking for opportunities in their problems? Are they, do the problems that they're trying to solve represent opportunities that they are that they're pursuing? And if they're focused on tactics or strategies, they're not a builder. If they're focused on opportunities, that's when you know that you're working with the builder. Now, as I've been going through this, I hope you've also been applying this to yourself, thinking about your own your own thought process. How are you approaching your work? And even as I was preparing for this episode, I had to go back and look at myself and, and really check myself because there are times when my vision, I say 100%, you know, the vision for us here at MindStuffs is that, and at Buildership University is that 100% of the builders we support achieve their 100% vision. That's our vision. So everything we do, we're not there yet, but everything we do is designed to get us closer and closer. How do we help every single person we support achieve their vision? If I get out of that mindset, then my vision is not big enough. The work that I'm doing is not focused on that vision and I'm not being a builder. Okay. And then I have to check myself and I hope you're checking yourself too about thinking about my time horizons. A lot of times I'm like, you know, let's just get through this quarter. And when I say that, uh, ding, ding, that's a sign I've slipped out of buildership. And so I have to catch myself and recognize that I'm investing in the long term. The other part of that is that if I grab a tactic to solve a problem right now, but it's not something that I see ourselves doing a decade from now, I don't do it for a day. And so I have to catch myself. And, and I had to do that this week. There was so, you know something that was kind of I was stressed out about. And then I was like, oh, well, we'll just do this for right now. And I thought, if I'm not going to do it for a decade, I shouldn't do it for a day. Okay. So that was the second thing. I want you to check yourself in terms of how you, what kind of problems are you solving? Do you spend your day thinking about tactics? Do you spend your day thinking about strategy? Or do you spend your day thinking about and looking for opportunities? And if you are 
doing anything but looking for opportunities, you slipped out of buildership, come back, come back to us so that you can do the work that you really need to do and achieve what you really want to achieve for your students. So three tells the, the bigness of their vision, the length of their time horizon, and the quality of their problems. Those are three things that will let you know that the person you are interviewing or the person with whom you're interviewing or the person with whom you're working is either a boss, a leader, or are they approaching everything they do like a builder? I'll talk to you next time. Hey, if you're ready to get started being a builder right away, then I want to invite you to join us at Buildership University. It's our exclusive online community for builders just like you, where you'll be able to get the exact training that you need to turn your school into a success story right now with the people and resources you already have. Inside, you'll find our best online courses, live trainings with me, tons of resources, templates and exemplars, and monthly live office hours with me where you can ask me anything and get my help on whatever challenge you're facing right now. If you're tired of hitting obstacle after obstacle and you're sick of tiny little incremental gains each year, if you're ready to make a dramatic difference in your school right now, then you need to join Buildership University. Just go to buildershipuniversity.com and get started writing your school success story today. Hey, real quick before you go, if you enjoyed today's episode and you know someone who would really benefit from what you heard here today, maybe they're struggling with the thing that we talked about in today's episode, would you take a moment and share this episode with them? You see, not only will it help us get the word about buildership out to more people, but you're going to look like a rock star because you're going to give people something they can really use to help them get unstuck and be better at building their schools. Plus, it would mean the world to me. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.